first we will introduce uh, NATO's Deputy Secretary General, Gewana. Uh, Mr. Gewana was in Oslo exactly one year ago, tomorrow, <laughs> when I hosted him, and it's so good to see you back. Uh, he has been uh, Deputy Secretary General since 2019 and was also Minister of Foreign Affairs as well as President of the Romanian Senate in his homeland. Please, Mr. Gioana, take the podium. Uh, thank you, Kate. Uh, times goes fast. Um, uh, thank you so much, uh, also Anne Grete, to the Norwegian Atlantic Committee. It's a privilege to be again with you with such a distinguished audience. It's also an incredible honor to speak in this great university, but also in this incredible room, surrounded by the work of the world-renowned Edvard Munch. And if you look to the painting on that wall, an old man from the fjords and a young boy, that work is called History. Hello, Minister. The red cap worn by the old man represents freedom. The old man has struggled for many years and is telling this boy his stories so the child can learn, learn the lessons of previous generations and carry the torch when he will grow up to his children and grandchildren. Here in Europe, we also wear freedom with pride. It was hard won. Together, in this alliance, we defeated fascism and then communism. Our nations embraced democracy, liberty, and rule of law. And yes, we have thrived. Your Prime Minister just said that the new Iron Curtain is about to be reinstalled in Europe. He also said, as a Norwegian and many of the Allies, that the lack of freedom and dictatorship is an abstract notion to many. It is not for me. I lived behind the Iron Curtain for half of my life. And I hope the young one will remember my speech. So what we are now, in fact, defending while helping Ukraine. We are, in fact, fighting for our values. And we are telling the stories of so many struggles that have shaped us and represent what we are today and what we'll leave to the next generations tomorrow. For the first time in many decades, our values, these values, are under attack. We live in an era of strategic competition. And Europe finds itself in the middle of this struggle. Our next summit in Vilnius in July will be vital. I would like to thank Norway for hosting the foreign ministerial meeting of NATO, which will be an important preparation on the way to this very important summit. In Vilnius, our leaders will reconfirm what we have decided in Madrid and will steer the course of action in the right direction and the speed of relevance. Our leaders will have a lot to discuss in Vilnius. Of course, our first priority is Ukraine. President Putin's war of aggression against Ukraine is the biggest conflict in Europe since the Second World War. And a brutal and deliberate attack on the international rules-based system. When Putin's forces invaded almost a year ago, he expected swift victory. He didn't get it. 
because he made two strategic mistakes. First, he underestimated the skill and bravery of the Ukrainian people. And also, he underestimated our unity, our solidarity, and the strength of NATO and of our partners. The United States of America has committed almost 50 billion euros of military, financial, and humanitarian assistance to Ukraine. The rest of the allies here in Europe and Canada, including the European Union institutions, have committed over 60 billion euros, including a significant contribution from Norway. I would like to thank Norway, and I'm also looking forward to seeing the transcript of the Prime Minister's speech in the Parliament for the multi-year contribution of your great country to our friends in Ukraine. Not to mention the economic and political sanctions. This is truly transatlantic unity in action. And our support is making a big difference on the battlefield. When this war ends, it will most likely end at the negotiating table. Most wars do. But Ukraine's success then, when peace will be finally reached, depends on their strength now. So it is essential that we stay the course and support Ukraine for as long as it takes. Jens yes, Totterbrink said quite tellingly that it seems counterintuitive. The more support we give to Ukraine now, the sooner the war would end. This is something that our allies, I know, will be reconfirming in Vilnius and the way forward. The next priority will be bolstering our deterrence and defense. This is the mission of the Alliance. While we support Ukraine, we must also continue to strengthen our own defense to protect all allies against any threat from any direction. Even if war ended tomorrow, things would not go back to how they were. Our security environment has fundamentally changed and we face a long-term adversarial relationship with Russia. Yes, we need dialogue. Yes, we need to see this war ended soon. But the fundamentals of this relationship are altered for the foreseeable future. So we must retain the capacity and capability to defend the alliance against all these challenges. Progress is underway to rapidly scale up our battle groups in the eastern flank up to brigade level as needed, and put more troops at high readiness. And I applaud Norway's contribution to the German-led battle group in Lithuania. Also at NATO, I lead innovation. We also need to innovate to stay ahead of our rivals. We can see this already in Ukraine. Ukrainian forces used Google traffic to see the messaging, the massing of forces before the attack. Also, our intel said the same thing. They use natural language processing and technology to listen to unencrypted Russian communications. And by using what is essentially a dating app, they have cut the time for requesting an artillery strike from about half an hour to just a few minutes. This is the fusion between bravery, intelligence, and technology, and training. Technologies can make the difference between winning and losing. We have to make sure that we have them and that we deny them to our rivals. But we also need to find the right balance between high-tech with high-intensity weapons. And this is where NATO is at its best. The NATO Supreme Allied Commander, General Cavoli, recently said in Stockholm, if I'm not mistaken, if the other guys show up with a tank, you better have a tank. 
But the war has demonstrated the continuing importance of heavy weapons, of tanks, artillery, missiles, and drones. And we must balance digital warfare with kinetic warfare if we are to maintain our security. And we should avoid a sort of a dichotomic relationship between conventional high-intensity and digital high-end warfare. No, it's one thing. It's multi-domain. While running a tank, you also use technology and sensors and space and cyber. So we have to make sure, and this is where NATO is at its best, that we don't create false dilemmas for appropriating the resources that our taxpayers are investing in our defense. We are working with the defense industry to ramp up production of weapons, equipment, and ammunition. And this is again NATO's role, to send a signal, a demand signal to industry. Because for good reasons, they say, is this effort that you're asking from us to ramp up production, to hire people, to get loans from the banks, to invest, sustainable? Or is it just a short-lived spike of demand? This is again where NATO comes at its best. Through our new NATO planning processes, through our new political guidance 2023, through our innovation agenda, and as all allies can really find the right balance and the right kind of investments and the right kind of communication and needs for industry. And by the way, this is not only defense sector, industry sector, it's also technology sector. Because more than 90% of the technology we use in, in, in military purposes across the alliance is produced by the private sector, by venture capital. So we need to stay in close touch with industry and give them a clear demand signal. We need to partner with big tech companies and startups as well to ensure that we develop and adopt advanced technologies for military or dual use, as we call them. This is why we have set up DIANA, which is the Defense Innovation Accelerator for the North Atlantic, where allies are putting together test centers, accelerators, and try to find and spur this kind of innovation coming from startups. We also have put a Defense Investment Fund, which is the first ever multinational sovereign venture capital fund. Seems like a contradiction in terms. It is not. It's not a venture capital fund. That's for the industry to establish and invest where they see potential. What we are doing, we are congregating resources from sovereign nations into a small fund to put some seed money for the startups that will need a little bit of money, testing their technologies in our Diana centers, and thus making them cross the desert between an idea and the markets easier, and then the real investment would eventually come. And I thank Norway for their strong support for both initiatives, including by hosting a test center for Diana. In Vilnius, it will be important to demonstrate solid progress. We keep our deterrence credible, and we keep our defense strong, this is the best way to secure peace in a more contested and competitive world. And of course, all of this costs money. And I like the question and the answer by the Prime Minister. And this brings me to one of the big priorities in Vilnius, which is defense investment. One lesson that we can already learn from the war in Ukraine is that we need to invest more in defense. The 2% of GDP target set in Wales almost a decade ago is increasingly seen as a floor and not a ceiling. More allies are already spending 2% or more or are committing to spending at least 2%. Others still follow. I welcome Norway's announced increases, but it needs to go further. I expect all allies to meet their defense spending commitments. We need well-trained, well-equipped soldiers with modern capabilities ready to deploy faster and defend our democracy, our prosperity, our way of life, and the system of international norms 
in the world. Another priority in Vilnius will be China. Russia is our most immediate threat, but is not the only one. Beijing's coercive policies and stated ambitions challenge our values, interests, and security. Beijing is substantially building up its military forces, including nuclear weapons, and without transparency. It is attempting to assert control over the South China Sea and threatening Taiwan. It is trying to take control of all critical infrastructure, including ports and airports, repressing its own citizens through advanced technology and spreading Russian disinformation about NATO and the war in Ukraine. We must not repeat the mistake we made with Russian energy with Chinese rare earth materials. To be dependent is to be vulnerable. China is not an adversary, but they do not share our values. We need to stand united as allies and with our, many of our global partners. Defending our values and international rules is a collective effort. Before I conclude, and saluting also the Defense Minister from, from Finland, a few words on Finland and Sweden. So far, this has been the fastest accession process in recent NATO history. All 30 allies invited them to join last June. I have to say that Secretary General Stoltenberg invested tremendous political, diplomatic, and leadership skills in Madrid itself. I think he spent almost eight hours in a busy summit anyway with the three leaders from the three countries. And the Memorandum of Understanding is also part and an expression of our strong desire and our Secretary General's strong desire and us, his team, to see the process completed. 28 allies have already ratified their accession protocols. But both Finland and Sweden are already sitting at NATO's table and are closely integrated in our political consultations and military activities. Their security has already been significantly strengthened with several allies providing security assistance and assurances. So it is unconceivable that NATO would not act, even at this stage, if the security of Sweden and Finland were threatened. Sweden and Finland have delivered. It is time to welcome them as full members in NATO. Their accession will make our whole land stronger, our people safer. And as a guy coming from the Black Sea, I will say that it is not only strengthening the accession of Sweden and Finland, not only strengthen the Baltic and the North, and the North Sea and the High North coherence. It's obvious. And by the way, this will be the reuniting the Scandinavian nations after 1949, when three, Iceland, Denmark, and Norway, decided to go through as NATO, and for the reasons that we fully respect, Sweden and Finland decided to go through a different path. Now the whole family is, is, is back in, in, in one room. But it's not only about the North. The accession of these two countries are bringing coherence from the North to the Baltic to the Black and Mediterranean seas. This is giving us not only strength in the north, but amplitude and strategic power all over the place. And the reputation of these two countries, also with third nations that are not yet convinced by, by, our, by our rhetoric, I would encourage anyone from the global south to go and ask our Finnish and Swedish friends if somebody coerced them into joining NATO or they really considered, as democratic nations, that their best place is with us. The young child in Munch's painting would now be a very old man himself, because history never stops. The struggle for freedom never stops. Next year, in April, it will be the 75th anniversary of NATO, the greatest alliance in human history. NATO was born from the fires of war and from violence and destruction and extreme ideologies to ensure our peace and security. Today we are facing a resurgence 
of authoritarian counter-propositions to our values. It is up to our generation and the generations to come to continue the struggle, to do whatever it takes to make our land strong and our values, our freedom and prosperity protected for many generations to come. Thank you all so very much. Thank you. Please Dr. take a seat. Wait, me there. I would ask you all to come up. It's a nice painting indeed. Savola Onru and Cecilia Björnir. Please find a seat. Together with friends, time is running fast. <laughs> we have approximately 20 minutes for a conversation left before we're going to have a coffee break. And as you know, this is a cultural heritage uh, building, so we are not allowed to drink coffee inside, so we have to go out and snap some fresh winterly air and have a cup of coffee before we continue. Uh, the title of this session is Ukraine Holds the Future of Democracy and Security in Europe. I would like to ask you, Giovanna, what are the main lessons learned for NATO after a year of warfare in Ukraine? Oh, sorry for speaking too long at the speech, yeah. first of all. Um, <laughs> You're stealing our time. I will, I will try to have my, my answers in compensation shorter. Um, I think for, for me, um, and I think for the Alliance, and I think for all of us, the first lesson is that when a nation is really fighting for its freedom, its sovereignty, and its future, it becomes a formidable force. And Ukraine has found in, in itself a capacity to, to, to be of a level of bravery and sophistication and innovation in warfare, mm. just incredible. Of course, after 2014, after the invasion of Crimea and a portion of the Donbas, Ukrainians came to us, to NATO, for, and I see Camille Grand, uh, our former, my former colleague, uh, and also Ambassador Nergo, thank you so much for, for doing such a great job as representing uh, Norway at NATO. They came to us for training. And one of the explanations is that the second explanation, the fact that you have a sort of a, when you have an existential threat, you have a capacity as a nation to go to a level which is probably unthinkable for nations that are a little bit more complacent, so to speak, so not put in such front such of a, such of a threat. The second one is the fact that they already incorporated very well command and control, this kind of very, very flat structures of command, while Russia remains a sort of a post-Soviet military culture, plus corruption, plus inefficiencies. And the third lesson to me is that they also communicated superbly well at the outside. Hmm. They knew how to talk to our public opinions. President Zelensky came to, I think, address every single parliament. Hmm. And in every parliament, like I try to do with this beautiful, symbolical fresque by Munch, he was basically pressing the emotional and sentimental and strategic buttons in a good sense. So this will be for me. Of course, my colleagues in the military, or my colleagues in the intelligence community, my colleagues in, 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 in defense and foreign policy, they have many other lessons. But for me, these are the three uh, yeah. fundamental ingredients of their success. Yeah. Thank you. I would like to welcome Cecilia Björner, the Swedish ambassador uh, in our panel. Um, you are here because Paul Jonsson couldn't come due to an emergency meeting. After the tumults, uh, after the burning of the Koran before the Turkish embassy in Stockholm. So uh, they are discussing that today. Could you comment a little bit on this unfortunate situation and see it in um, the light of the missing ratification from Turkey? 
Thank you, Kate, for that question, because I, I know it is a, a, a great interest in these issues, so, so I'm, I'm glad to be able to, to try to shed some light. And my first comment would still be, uh, because it's extremely important to say that the strong support from all NATO members uh, and the welcoming, as we heard here, was, uh, is a great uh, fundament uh, for the Swedish position, of course. Mm. We have uh, already 28 ratification, one of the speediest, if not the, the speediest process ever. So we feel comfortable and mm. we are looking forward uh, the day we will be fully members. Uh, this uh, occasion that you referred to has caused a lot of turbulence in the Muslim world as a whole. I see from my colleagues around uh, in the Muslim world of uh, uh, demonstration and also threats to our embassies. So, of course, there is a big concern and uh, an alert of this mm. situation. The fact is, uh, the basic fact is uh, extreme uh, support solid support in our constitution for the freedom of speech. Uh, it is also a, a, a broad and wide uh, interpretation of this constitutional right. Mm. Uh, and it's a strong part of our culture, our identity, as it is in the Nordic countries, in Europe countries, is a strong part of our values. So there is no compromise here to be made on this fundamental uh, democratic principle and value in the Swedish mm. uh, society. And just to finish it, we should remember that the, the agreement of memorandum that was signed in, in Madrid uh, does not include uh, discussions on this. So we are uh, very uh, eager and uh, uh, constructive and open for further discussions with mm. Turkey on all these issues. Uh, okay. Thank you. Savlo, I have uh, to ask you. Your Prime Minister was in Stockholm <coughs> last week uh, and um, assured uh, the Swedish Prime Minister that this journey we are going to do hand by hand. We are entering NATO together. But given that I saw an opinion poll that 55% of the Finns did not want to wait for Sweden if Turkey is not going to ratify. You have upcoming elections in this autumn. If this number Spring. increases, uh, how long can you wait for Sweden? Yeah, of course, people have their opinions. And if I look <laughs> one year ago, what, what happened in Finland, the polls for the NATO were like 20 to 25 exactly. percent and then it totally changed after Russians attacked to, to Ukraine and, and now the Finns are supporting NATO for over 80 percent so, so that number is high, high as well so that shows that the people are aware and they want us to, to join NATO rapidly but of course it's our job to explain that why it's important to join together with Sweden hand, hand in, in hand. And uh, I see that we are part of the Nordic countries and it's better for us, it's better for, for the Swedes, it's better for NATO itself that we are joining both to the NATO and, and, and at, at the same time when we are making the the political planning and the operational planning, how we, uh, how we secure the Northern Europe. And uh, this is the main issue why I think that uh, it, it's, it's very important to go together with, with, with the Sweden. I know that NATO is making uh, their, their political planning about the future. After, and, and after we are the members, it's better for us to be part of the Nordic, Nordics than part of the Baltics. 
Yes. Um, you mentioned in your speech that uh, you have, uh, your country has contributed above and beyond expectations for non-NATO members to Ukraine, actually, if I may say it. In doing so, have you taken the risk uh, that Russia may target you for retaliation? How do you see the possibility for that? You have a very long border to Russia. Yes. 1,304 meters, if mm. I'm correct. Yeah, it is the longest border what, what NATO will have after we, we join the NATO. And uh, of course, that's why we want to keep our own defense forces strong. We have mm -hmm. a common conscription in, in, in Finland. We have a trainee reserve, as I say, 280,000 uh, uh, wartime troops. And, and the total amount of the reserve is just over 900,000. So, so this is what we want to keep still we are in the NATO. And we know that uh, in, the, in the future as well, we, are, we, we have to defend our, country, our, our own country by our, ourselves still. And the Article 5 will give us, give us more, more uh, support and, and a guarantee that we will have a help, a help as well. But we have a neighbor, which is challenging neighbor. <laughs> neighbor. I, I must say, we have a long border. There are some issues what we need to uh, as, as the Prime Minister er, earlier mentioned, that there are some issues what we still need to handle with the Russians. But the border control, for example, we have that, and we, 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 need, we need to do, do those things. But it will take a long, long time to have better relationship with, with, uh, with, with the Russia. Mm. Onuru, uh, Norway has also contributed, as the Prime Minister said, and also you stated in your speech, with weapons to Ukraine, and we will contribute with more. Uh, do you see any risks uh, in connection with that for Norwegian security? We are also neighboring Russia. And is it any limits to what we will provide? Um, first of all, it is both a moral duty and also a practical necessity that we contribute to Ukraine's uh, fight for its freedom. Um, and of course, there has been a significant development um, in what we have donated to Ukraine in terms of military support from, from um, anti-tank missiles to artillery and to last week's decision to um, donate main battle tanks. Um, of course, for each step, we make careful considerations about uh, what we can donate from our own defense structures. Um, but I will underline that these, even though these um, analyses are national, we do our donations in close cooperation with our international allies and I think that is our insurance policy sort of uh, we are not doing this together we are evolving together with our NATO allies and I think it's um, difficult to sit here today and sort of try to um, try to see three months or half a year or one year into the future and say what we will or won't do because that's, this past year has shown us that this war is unpredictable. Mm. Uh, Russia is unpredictable, and uh, Ukraine's needs is unpredictable. And I think it is our common duty to try to answer that as best as we can. So right now, I think I will limit myself to say that we will try to um, try to help Ukraine as best as we can, uh, as long as they need. Mm. Thank you. We all keep on saying, or it's changed actually during this year of war, that we will deny Russia a victory. And now we talk about we will make everything, all of our efforts to make Ukraine win the war. But I wonder, should limits continue to be imposed on what military capabilities the Western democracies are willing to provide for Ukraine to win? If such limits are removed, what are the danger of escalation and how can they be mitigated? Guiana. This is, the, this is the, the job of NATO and Secretary General and all of us are doing this 
every single day. So the first job of NATO is to defend allies. I mentioned Sweden and Finland because they are already so close to us. So the first job is to defend 32 allies. That's the number one job. The second job is to do our best to help Ukraine prevail in this effort. Because if we don't, and Russia eventually prevails, and by the way, Russia is still very dangerous. Mm -hmm. You hear, and also from the north and high north, including from, uh, from allied sources, that many of the Russian presence is not there anymore just because they had to, to bring them to Ukraine, but doesn't mean that Russia cannot regenerate those forces and those capabilities quite fast. But at the same time, with defending the allies, supporting Ukraine, our job is to avoid escalation. It is not our interest and our intention, and everything we do is to avoid escalation already of a bloody war into an even com more complicated war between NATO and Russia. Hmm. How we can do that? Of course, the best way is to maintain some of the military channels of communication because the risk of incident or accident. Russia indeed doesn't have the capacity to, 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 to start something against NATO. We are way too big and too powerful. But incident, accident can happen. So I think that this is something that we have always to keep in mind, and this is the, the if you want, the triad that we keep in mind is defending allies, helping Ukraine, and avoiding escalation. And I would say that also allies individually or collectively through the Rammstein process, they've always been keeping this very fine balance between providing Ukraine with more, but also making sure that this is not transformed to something that will escalate into something further. Mm. It's not easy, politically, uh, but this is the way in which we have been conducting business and we'll, can do, we'll do the same thing in the future. Should Ukraine be given a membership action plan? Again, this is, you know, I'm coming from Romania. Uh, in the NATO Bucharest summit, which is the capital of Romania, by the way, um, <laughs> uh, open doors uh, was reconfirmed. I'm a strong believer in open doors. I was 37 years of age when I was ambassador to Washington, and nobody believed that my country would ever join NATO or the European Union. We did. So I say that every European democracy that is really prepared to join, and we are ready to receive them, should be part of the family. I will never change, we'll never change our policy. But in order to, to be there, we are now in the middle of the war, of a difficult war. So I think our leaders will decide whatever they, they will decide in Vilnius. Um, and I think the number one thing is to help Ukraine now prevail in this war, and of course prepare the foundations for a relationship with Ukraine. Uh, the EU is doing the same. Uh, I applaud the fact that there was this big meeting in Kiev just the other day. That's great. So we have to, 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 to help Ukraine now win the war and then create the conditions for Ukraine and Moldova and Georgia and the Western Balkans, all the unfinished business. Because in the end, if they qualify and they stay the course and we are ready to receive by consensus, I think all European democracies should be part of the family, hmm. be it NATO, be it EU, or whatever creative solutions might be found. I have a, a question from the audience. The elephant in the room is nuclear war, Savola. Mm -hmm. Will a victory in the conventional theater of war end with Russia using tactical nukes in Ukraine and elsewhere? How is the debate in Finland about the possibility of a nuclear theater? Yeah, it's, it's a very good, good, good question and a, and a big question. Of course, we know that when we are the NATO members, we are under the uh, uh, nu nuclear uh, power umbrella as, as well. And um, in, in the Finland, we don't have that big debate on that issue. Uh, we have uh, some issues. What, what, what we are debating about, will we have a NATO forces in the Finland in the mm. future or, uh, or nuclear uh, uh, weapons and, and so on. But, uh, but uh, we, we have said, said that we are quite open-minded for, for everything what happens in the, in the NATO in the future. We don't know yet 
uh, what kind of the NATO, NATO membership will be in the future. We will be an active, active member mm. and, and we have a open, open doors, of course, uh, what, what becomes to the Finnish, uh, developing the fin Finnish uh, defense and, and the Northern Europe defense and so on. But um, I must say that we are not, not worried on that. We, we of course, trust that the, the bigger countries can, can uh, handle this, this issue who has the nuclear weapons, weapons as, as well. You underlined in your speech that uh, Finland will be a security provider and yes. not only a security consumer when entering NATO. So what's the main benefit of joining the alliance seen from Helsinki? And I would also like an uh, answer mm. from Stockholm. It's of course our Article 5. Mm -hmm. it's, we, we don't have that. We have our own strong defense, but we don't have Article 5. We have many partnerships with, with Sweden, with Czech countries, uh, with, in Nordefco, uh, with, with USA and, and so on, bilateral, trilateral with Norway and, and so on. But we don't have Article 5 and that's the main issue why, 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 mm. what, what we benefit on that. But as I said, we are, a, uh, we are security providers. Uh, we are not begging help all the time for the little issues. We can mm. handle by ourselves, but uh, of course this Article 5 is a big thing for us in the future. Article 5 also for Sweden. Of course, I will make it easy for you because I see the time is running out. <laughs> it's, it's, time. More, it's more or less copying what my Finnish colleague is saying. I mean, it's a, it is the security guarantees, but also, uh, if I may add, it will be even easier, stronger, better cooperation uh, in between the two countries and in the Nordic part of NATO. So there is, a, it, it will help to rebuild even a stronger security and de defense situation for ourselves, but also for our family. Can, can I jump in because time is 20 seconds? Um, you have run off in time. <laughs> Listen, NATO, NATO of course is Article 5. And this is the, the foundation of what we are, and that's why NATO is so attractive to many nations. But also NATO is a political alliance. Exactly. This is the platform where all allies, 32 allies, are debating all issues, all issues related to security. All issues related to security. From critical infrastructure and the sea cables, and I, I welcome Norway and the Norwegian and, and, and German initiative, and this is something we, we fully support because we will be seeing hybrid activities, cyber attacks, mm. resilience, is a problem of security, and your countries, Sweden and Finland, will be bringing a lot of sophistication when it comes to our common resilience. It's, it's about many technology, dual-use technology, quantum computing and encryption, innovation in defense, mm. Mm. space. All these things are better dealt with together, learning from each other, pooling resources and political unity together. Yeah. We are a force for good. Article 5, of course, is the foundation and the backbone, but in fact NATO is, is a much broader platform and encompasses basically everything we are dealing with, mm. uh, both from a military and civilian standpoint. So that's the beauty, and we really would, would welcome these two great nations joining our ranks. I think it was Benjamin Franklin who said, it's better we hang together or will we hang one by one. <laughs> so thank you very much for a good uh, conversation. We should have had one more hour. But give them a big applause. Thank you, ma'am.